right. Well, we have a uh, full almost 20 people already. So I will start to uh, kick us off here. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for joining today. Um, for anyone that is new or attending this call for the first time, we've been holding this month, uh, this industry wide call every month for really any company that wants to participate in the cultivated meat value chain. And the purpose of these calls is really to introduce and welcome new solutions providers into the industry with the end goal that new collaborations will be established that can help accelerate some of the R&D and commercialization. So if your group is interested in presenting on a future call or maybe you're working with a company that could benefit on uh, you know, just attending these calls or being on this, this group, um, please feel free to, to put them in touch with me directly and I'll be happy to, to sort of get them added. So uh, a couple of housekeeping items today. Um, for anyone that is interested or currently working on cultivated seafood, uh, you can join us at our next Fish and Chips event um, where you'll have the opportunity to network with other scientists and discuss topics like scale up, uh, modeling and data sharing and IP. Um, we're hosting a, an event on November 28th from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. And I will drop the link in the chat and we can also share that uh, after the uh, follow-up email in case you wanna sign up for that. So this is in the chat here. Um, and then also just wanted to make folks aware in case you haven't seen, Italy actually passed a ban on cultivated meat today. Um, this was in discussion for a while within their uh, sort of legislature, but this, this ban actually did go through it would prevent cultivated meat from being manufactured in Italy, as well as uh, really research and R&D from being funded in Italy. So um, we have a statement from our GFI Europe team in case people are interested in reading through that. And if you have other questions, you can contact our GFI Europe colleagues um, who are working to sort of better understand that situation and what to do in the future. All right, so with that, um, today's speakers, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Gabriella Naya from Extracellular and Subramani Rich from Firmbox Bio, both of whom are going to be discussing uh, some of their co-development and manufacturing solutions for the, the cultivated meat industry. So as always, you can feel free to drop questions in the chat throughout, um, or otherwise we can get to them at the end of each of the half hour uh, marks. So uh, Subu, I will turn it over to you for the first half hour. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you, everybody else who's on this call. Uh, I've been part of a few calls and definitely we made uh, several connections. And of course, Elliot, as always, very kind to make those connections. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to take you through the slides and talk about what we do and uh, who we are. Um, and also, we see a certain problem area in cultivated meat, which is about scaling. And we think it's not just uh, scaling, but the evolution in technology that is happening so fast that instead of calling it built to suit, we are thinking of a model which says built to scale so that we can evolve a CMO opportunity where we work with you all the way from the idea and evolve with you the process, the technology and help you scale. Personally, my background, I've been an entrepreneur for more than 20 years, uh, built a microbial fermentation uh, facility, uh, producing recombinant proteins. We initially started off as a company to make medicine safer. So back in 2010, we made products uh, for insulins and uh, MABs and vaccines, et cetera, but they were using animal derived components. So we started making those products using recombinant technology. So we made medicines safer because they were now viral free, cleaner, traceable, et cetera. And then uh, everything changed in 2016 and 17. We became more conducive to thinking of biomaterials, cultivated meat. And many of the products we made uh, were used by cultivated meat companies to grow their cells, like growth factors and albumin and transferrin, et cetera. And then we said, it's time to make food grade versions. And we did that. And my previous organization, Loris Bio, I can proudly say is the leader in producing uh, food grade um, ingredients um, meant for cultivated meat. And as a second journey, we said, this industry needs to collaborate more. We need to create more flexible collaborative options. 
and a CMO alone, a CMO model alone where you rent facilities and pay top dollars to do your evolution of technology is very expensive. And we decided to create Firmbox where whether it's synthetic bio or cultivated meat, we actually partner with you, share your risk and help you scale and build infrastructure that you need as you go along. So I think the need is quite obvious, but I had to put this as a background slide. Um, there's no doubt that there are too many variables in cultivated meat. Uh, the opportunity exists, but there's enough and more problems to solve all the way from cell lines, growth media, manufacturing, sca scaffolding, downstream, and eventually uh, making a finished product and rolling out in distribution. And I don't think any one company could solve all these problems. Uh, and if it could, we would have had uh, magic already done. And that's uh, because I feel knowledge is in pockets and people have expertise all over the world. And we are stepping out to say, how do we connect these pockets of knowledge and bring them together uh, to be an enabler in this industry? I think primarily the challenges, I'm not going to spend too much time. It's here on the slide. You guys, um, I'm sure, know these challenges if you're part of the cultivated meat uh, industry. And I want to focus on the solutions we want to bring. Firstly, we want to build uh, and create infrastructure that suits you, uh, an individual company which is making uh, fish cells or chicken or uh, beef or whatever it is. Uh, we realized uh, as we developed our growth media that each cell requires a very different uh, expertise. Obviously, because each of these cells grew in different animals and uh, just like a different animal could make a different cell, uh, I think the manufacturing processes, the media and everything around that also has to be quite unique and specific. I don't think any cultivated meat company could you know, switch a cell line and say, we figured it out for cell one and we'll be able to do that to cell two. So the idea is to uh, build facilities with cross-functional capabilities because building cells, getting them to a final product, you're already solving a lot of problems. And I think putting them into large-scale manufacturing requires a very different skill set, putting steel on the ground, being compliant to the environment, being compliant to the regulators, getting the documentation in place. It's kind of a dirty job, but it may not be sexy, but it's very, very important that we get that right. And putting people who have actually done scale up of cells, whether it's biopharma cells or anything else, is very important to get them together as you scale up. And one of our solutions we want to offer is a built to suit model. So even if you're at a 50 liter scale, I think you would need a lot of the manufacturing expertise, documentation expertise, and tailor uh, people with tailored experience to help you solve some of the areas which you would take a lot, a lot longer to actually master. Two is uh, to find ways to minimize your risk. I think while the funding is available for novel technologies, it's not always going to be there when you need it. And I think you would like to have partners who would actually share your risk, either it's in process improvement, development, or simply in the kind of costs you're going to incur to do these kind of iterations. So we are stepping up uh, to say, we would love to share the risk with you. Um, I mean, my investors are going to be upset with that, but the idea is to share your risk and be your partner in your story. Third is built to scale. When I engaged with many of the cultivated meat companies who are in very advanced stages, I saw that in their journey, while because we were providing them cell culture media, the technology is evolving, not just in cells, but the bioreactors, in the way they recycle the media, how they're able to prepare their media. How do you ship so much media in cold temperature across the globe? Because you're not going to make all the individual components that you need to have. We also respect the fact that each cultivated meat company has its own unique process. It has a unique media, and that's the IP, because there's nothing new in the cell itself, but the whole process is critical. And then should you want to scale, you would want to have a partner who would evolve the scale with the evolving technology. So 
I worked with a company where they started with a certain process and then they wanted to make changes to the bioreactor. And then they wanted to make changes to how they would recycle the media. Then they wanted to make changes to how they will concentrate the spent media so that it's now toxic free or ammonia free and bring them back to the cells. How do we separate dead cells during the process? How do we extend the process? And this is evolving, but you don't have time to solve all these problems to produce samples for your market, for creating awareness, to get regulatory approvals. And the manufacturing partners should be willing to make those adjustments in the manufacturing setup and scale and evolve the technology with you. Of course, we work with uh, equipment manufacturers, kind of building kind of collaborative partnerships to do that tinkering for you. So you wouldn't have to be bothered too much about making the changes, engaging with the equipment manufacturer, we could do that for you. And the most important thing, I think the team and expertise, I think uh, most of us could develop these cells in the lab quite easily, quite fast. But I think the expertise that comes in scale up is very different. I always give the example of you know, going by a car for a meeting or going by a busy train. Um, these cells are going to react like how we do if we are in a very changed environment. Uh, we become toxic, so do the cells. And I think the, an experienced team who's taken cells from the lab to the pilot to the next scale, maybe 1,000, 2,000 uh, liter bioreactors, have a certain learning, which is kind of intuitive, kind of intangible. It's not documented. Uh, I've had cases where, where we were able to predict that this particular process is going to form uh, and it would impact the cells. And that was true because when we went through with the process, it did. Uh, and this knowledge is really not documented. And if you look at biopharma processes, they don't really build such scale. They're not concentrating the cells, but they're trying to take the supernatant. So combining you know, years of experience of growing cells and learning how they behave with scale is very critical. And I think that's something very difficult for a startup to put together very quickly. You could hire some consultants, advisors, but they would be uh, uh, having deep knowledge about a particular area, but not the next. And I think that's uh, something that we would like to help build and grow into your scale because it's not just the expert, but you need hands. You need, I would call them uh, the people who actually get the stuff done, the hands and legs in the plant. These guys need to be trained and be very aligned to what you do. Lastly, of course, the cost of uh, effective media. As I said earlier, we made uh, a lot of these in uh, Loris Bio uh, and uh, we have special access and collaboration with them. They are already active for, with many of you. So we're working with them closely on further optimizing these costs and you know, giving them inputs on how to make this uh, evolve. So by and large, we could more or less play a role in any one of these areas or all of them or some of them, depending on what you need. We also realize that as a partner, we cannot dictate to our development partner that we want to do all of it or we don't want to do something. We, we are okay to take the specific role that you would want us to help you with and create that kind of a support system which would make this work. And in terms of how do we collaborate, what does it cost? I think we are very open to it um, in terms of how do we share risk and how do we make sure that both sides benefit in the long run. And we have a very flexible model in arriving at how do we share value or how do we share the risk. So what we also did recently is looked at which are the countries we could actually do this, which are the countries which have free trade, which are the countries closer to the markets. Uh, coming from India and Southeast Asia, we are focusing on the markets around here. I think more than half the world's population is in India and China. Uh, and then um, we found that more than India, we found Southeast Asia to be very, very, very strategic geopolitically. And I'll explain why. And more importantly, it has free trade with most of the Asian countries. So, and it's a beautiful place to work in. And we saw there that there's an extremely conducive environment for synthetic bio and cultivated meat. Uh, personally, I'm involved with their policymakers and looking at how we can fast track this. And you'll be surprised that they've created one of the biggest bio foundries for synthetic bio investing $100 million. I don't think anywhere else in the world somebody has invested that kind of money for synthetic bio. And that country is more than happy and our partner is to build these capacities as you go along. And we've created 
basic infrastructure where we can customize the offer. Uh, Firmbox and our expertise uh, in these areas, coupled with BBGI, which is one of their, uh, it's a joint venture between, uh, surprisingly, an oil marketing company and a bio uh, energy company. They came together to create what they call like, you know, a green initiative venture. And we have a joint venture with them. Uh, we call them BBFB, FB being Firmbox, uh, to provide these kind of services, it could include product development, it could include scale up, it could include funding. Uh, but the idea is to not be the front runner saying that we make chicken or meat, we want to be the enabler to more than one company. Like that, we think we can create more sustainable impact. So one may ask, what do we actually do? We help develop products and solutions. We manufacture at both in-house and third party locations. And more importantly, we also help you build commercial partnerships. I can quote one example. There's this big uh, cultivated meat company who has a partnership for distribution, but they don't have the manufacturing in, in the target markets. And the target market is not big enough to have these kind of infrastructures. So Thailand being a very strategic market uh, with very quick even road access to these markets, are we are creating the infrastructure for them as they scale. Um, and thereby creating um, a very supportive partner in growth. Uh, a little bit about Thailand, I think uh, there's political stability. And I was surprised with the kind of talent people have, the kind of research institutes they're funded and the people there. And this was one country where I found that their skill development department in the government has a database of every single talented person in this area of synthetic bio, as well as cultivated meat or cell culture. And they've actually tagged them on a map. So you can actually see where they are, what's their expertise, where do they operate? And it's so much easier to bring in that talent to do the kind of solution. And of course, being a very international place, people love to go there for holidays, the infrastructure is great. And you could actually source expats from anywhere in the world and I don't think you'll find many countries where people don't want to go into Thailand and, you know, have a career and enjoy the place uh, as it is. More importantly, raw materials, this, you know, high standard of living and the strategic location makes Thailand very, very attractive. And though I'm from India, where everyone thinks India is the best place to create this infrastructure, I found the red tape, especially the red tape to set up and to get government support to even make Thailand a market, including the Southeast Asia, is very, very high there. And what is Thailand doing there, right? Uh, they are building on policy initiatives much ahead, even though you've not heard of any companies in cultivated meat coming out of Thailand, but you'll be surprised the kind of uh, white papers they have prepared and the kind of uh, initiatives they've taken towards cultivated meat. I think you they could be the next country after Singapore who's going to clear these regulations. So there's something uh, to balance out Italy, I guess. And then they have a very organized skill development program and people, and, and they're building further on that. And they are very open to collaborative public-private partnerships. So anyone who wants to create infrastructure with some kind of funding support and policy support to be successful, that seems to be quite a place to go to. And lastly, I traveled the length and breadth of Thailand and also in India, and I saw that infrastructure is kind of uniform in Thailand. You have places to stay, you have places to eat, you have places to put your people for uh, the jobs they need to do. And they're creating what they call an Eastern corridor where they're developing these novel uh, industries, including semiconductor, AI, and they're all in one huge cluster. So you could benefit from many of the other support industries that you could have, including fabrication, 3D printing, et cetera, all located in one place. Uh, why us? Of course, uh, we're saying we're, we're going to give you a plug and play facility and uh, we'll provide you with all the support we can on uh, the animal free growth media that you need. Uh, we have the expertise to not just help you with cell lines and managing them and uh, evolving them with you but also create different suits so that you can run different cells in the same time if you're going trying to make different cell lines, different species. And then in the scale of bioreactors, uh, we are happy to build from 50 liters all the way to 5,000 or even bigger, if at all uh, your cell line could take that. 
And our previous experience in cell manufacturing has been quite huge, but we never tapped into that. One, we grew all kinds of cells to grow the growth media. So we know a thing or two of doing that. We also worked with large vaccine companies and helped them uh, move towards cultivated bean manufacturing. In fact, we were working, and we still are working with a 40,000 liter bioreactor company in India uh, to help them transition a vaccine facility, which was built during COVID to be repurposed to create a cultivated meat setup. But it's so large that people are not able to use that as yet, but uh, we do have smaller facilities within that where you could easily benefit. And I think the other most important thing that I learned over years is the quality control and quality assurance. Uh, I don't think because it's food, it's any lower. In fact, it's higher um, and because it's going to go into people uh, and all over the world. So it's the way we need to approach documentation and traceability uh, and having people who can do that would only make your regulatory journey much easier, faster, and we understand that. And I think that's one big value we add to anybody we work with. Um, I'm happy to take questions. These are some of the cell lines we actually grew and scaled for companies. Uh, we had a bigger role to play here because this was a startup. We made fat cells for them. Uh, we did our 3D, 2D cultures. We helped them raise funding. Uh, so happy to play a small or a big role in your journey. Any questions? I'm happy to take that. Excellent. Thank you for that, that presentation and walkthrough, Subu. Excellent. All right. Well, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, you wanted to say something. Well, I mean, the idea is to anchor with one or two large companies so the infrastructure can survive and to create this small scale to scale up uh, model for anybody else who's in different stages of progress. Yeah, I think that that maps a lot with, you know, some of the survey data that we've collected. Um, you know, there's not a lot of co-manufacturing space right now out there in the world and especially in the down funding environment, you know, you, you, people don't want to go out and spend $10 million on a, on a pilot facility or, or what, what have you. So I think these are really important, which is why we brought you in and as well as our, our next speaker, uh, who's also trying to help alleviate some of that, that bottleneck. So, um, our next speaker is Gabriella uh, Naya from Extracellular, and I guess I will present the slides. I have them up on my screen, unless you can, um, unless you've been able to manage to share on your end, Gabriella. Let me know. Okay, so um, hi everyone. I'm Gabriella Naya from Extracellular, and I'm associate scientist here. Uh, thank you for having me today in the industry seminar. Um, and today I will be presenting to you how we developed our license-free cell banks for cultivated meat research. So if you could change the slide. Um, so let's start off with a brief introduction about extracellular. So extracellular is a CDMO dedicated to cultivated meat and seafood. Uh, the company was founded back in March 2022 uh, by our co-founder, Will Milligan. Uh, we're currently a team of 14 research scientists and bioprocess engineers. Uh, we're based in Bristol, uh, UK, uh, but we have global expansion plans. Um, we have over 400 meter squares of research labs, offices, and scale-up facilities, and we have ongoing projects uh, with um, six different, um, with 12 different companies across six different countries. Um, so this is some of the team here at Extracellular. As I mentioned, we're a mixture of research scientists and bioprocess engineers, uh, but we also have um, data analysts and we have our lovely lab manager, and we also have people in, involved in the facility designs for scale up. So the industry need and challenge. So currently cells for cultivated meat research are of poor quality. Uh, they're usually expensive and they usually come with limited information regarding their characterization and also their performance. Um, cells also come with uh, commercial licensing agreements that can um, usually impede the development of uh, new technologies. Um, this is why Extracellular has created these cell banks, which are affordable, high quality, and also license free. Um, so people in the industry can have access to them and be able to create um, new technologies and advance the cultivated meat um, field. So uh, let's dive in on how we developed and optimized the cell banks. 
So the project started back in November 2022 when we received an Innovate UK grant um, in collaboration with Motors Biotechnology. Uh, the aim of the project was to isolate primary cells from three different terrestrial animals from varying tissue samples types. Uh, we divide our cell bank creation into two phases. So phase one is when we started establishing uh, relationships with local farmers and also started collecting our first tissue samples from the University of Bristol's um, abattoir. And this is where we initially started carrying out our isolations, expanding the cells and then banking. And then phase two, which um, started at the um, middle of this year, is where we optimised our processes and started characterising our cells and also carrying out marketing and the sales of our cells, but also focusing in our in-house research and carrying out um, differentiation, immortalization, and also a suspension adaptation of the cells. So if we take a closer look of the process from isolation through to banking, you can see here that we've collected over 30 different tissue um, samples from pigs, cows, and lambs. And we've isolated cells from adipose, muscle, and bone marrow tissue. Uh, for this, the cells undergo enzymatic digestion, they're then strained, and then they're expanded for um, a maximum of three passages before being banked. And for banking, we have a semi-automated process in place where we use an automated liquid dispenser and also a decapper. And this allows us to fill um, 96 vials in under three minutes. Uh, once these are ready, uh, the cells go into a control rate freezer to ensure stable freezing temperatures and then they're stored in liquid nitrogen for a few days. Um, after, we start collecting postful uh, growth data. And for this, we fill the cells and collect data for a minimum of 10 passages. And we characterize the cells at passage two um, by um, carrying out some flow cytometry and also qPCR. Cells are also um, sterility tested for mycoplasma and um, for other pathogens too. Um, so the criteria for sales. For a cell bank to qualify for sales, there are certain criteria that we uh, must meet. So for example, at uh, four, uh, the viability and the viable cell count uh, should be above um, 70%. And the cell growth, the cell should present with a minimum of five doublings over three passages, and the cell should grow for a minimum of 10 passages. Um, cells should uh, be sterile and mycoplasma free. And for the characterization, they should present with minimum expression profiles following the data from flow cytometry and real-time qPCR. If we take a look at the improvements that we've made uh, comparing phase one to phase two, uh, we have here in the, in the table, for example, the number of successful isolations. So before this number was uh, quite low, it was 39% and then it increased to 67%. And before we were banking cells at passages uh, between four to seven, and now we bank um, cells at passages two to three, and we've seen a general uh, overall uh, better performance of the cells once you bank at a lower passage. Um, if we take a look at the average doubling time of the cells um, in 10% FPS with growth factor, you can see here that in phase one, uh, this was 83 hours. And now in phase two, this number has dropped to 59 hours. And the average highest uh, passage achieved post four, um, again, before quite low. So before the cells were only growing for a maximum of three passages. And as, as I mentioned in phase two, uh, the cells can grow now for a minimum of uh, 10 passages. Before, um, we didn't have the tools to carry out characterization data, but in phase two, we now can analyze gene expression and also analyze the surface marker expression with flow cytometry. And uh, we've been successful now differentiating um, our pre adipocytes into adipocytes and some of our my satellite cells. Um, and I'll show some data um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, if I highlight the challenges that we were faced in phase one, this includes um, having low cell numbers um, after isolation. Uh, when we were isolating cells from muscle tissue, there was quite a lot of debris as well. And uh, we were faced with quite a lot of contamination post the initial um, seed. And some of the optimization processes that we've put in place now include um, seeding cells at a much higher density. So we've calculated this number and we've increased by um, like tenfold and we've seen a better performance. Uh, we've also now have standardized protocols in place for each cell type and we quarantine ourselves as soon as they've been um, isolated. 
Um, this slide is to highlight the growth dynamics of all the cell banks that we've generated. So here I present uh, the average doubling time across three passages post four for all the cell um, lines that we've um, created. And you can see here that we've tested a variety of media formulations. So we've tested 20% at the start and 10% FBS and with and without growth factor. And here, I just want to highlight that in phase one, um, the only 28% of the cells presented with a population doubling time of less than 60 hours and 10% FBS, whilst this number in phase two has increased to 71%. Um, here, I uh, just wanted to show the cellular morphology of the primary cells. So as I mentioned, we've isolated cells from different species. So from cow, pig, and lambs, and we've isolated from different tissue types. Um, here we have the preadipocytes, the bone marrow MSCs, and also the myosatellite cells. And there are slight differences in the morphology and slight differences in the time that it takes um, to, for them to become confluent. We've also tested serum-free and xeno-free growth conditions on our cells. Uh, for example, here on the left, our collaborators, uh, Maltus Biotechnology, they have a serum-free alternative called Prolifrum M, and they compare this to FBS. So here we show the data for uh, bone marrow MSCs for sheep, cow, and pig uh, for passage one. And you can see here that for all species, um, Pro-M presents with a lower doubling time than FBS. Here on the right, we've also tested essential eight media plus the supplement for our myosatellite cells across three passages. And you can see um, here from the data that the, for all species, the cells present with similar doubling times um, when comparing the E8 to FBS with growth factor. Because we've generated so much data with the cell banks, we can have a look at the growth dynamics and the variability. Uh, for example, we can have a look at species variability. And uh, this is when we compare data from different species. So here we have um, cow in blue, lamb in green and pig in yellow on the left. And this is just to show, for example, for the cow, the myosatellites, creodipocytes and the bone marrow MSCs presents with a relative relatively similar um, average doubling time, whilst the pig, for example, if you take a look at the myosatellite cells, the average doubling time is slightly above 100 hours, whilst the preadipocytes and the bone marrow MSCs is below uh, 50 hours. We can also take a look at animal variability. This is when we compare data from different animals of the same species. Here I present some data from our lamb myosatellite cells. So we have animals one to six, and you can see here for animal one and animal three, uh, the average doubling time is greater um, than 100 hours. But if you take a look at animals two, four, five, and six, this number is below 50 hours. And finally, we can also take a look at tissue variability. This is when we compare different tissues of the same animal. For example, here we have a uh, pig number seven. And if we take a look at the preadipocytes and also the bone marrow MSCs, you can see that this, um, the average doubling time is quite similar, just around 55 hours, whilst the myosatellite cells, this number is just above um, 70 hours. Um, characterizing cells is uh, quite challenging. Um, this is because there is limited literature on the gene expression of the species of interest. Also finding antibodies which are species specific uh, is quite challenging and optimizing assays such as qPCR and flow cytometry is time consuming because um, there's a number of steps and um, protocols that you have to um, optimize before you can say that you have a reliable working assay. Also once you isolate cells there of a heterogeneous population and um, cell sorting is required if you want a pure population. However, FAX um, cell sorting option, uh, some methods are not well established, and it is known that you can also lose 90% um, of your population of interest. So now I'm gonna run through some early assay optimization data. So here we have um, flow cytometry and real-time real qPCR for our myosatellite cells. Um, here on the left, our myosatellite panel for flow cytometry include CD31 as our negative marker. This is a marker for endothelial and hemopatoetic cells, but not for myosatellite cells, whilst the CD29 and CD56 are positive markers for myosatellite cells. 
Here we have the free species, and you can see here on the left, the negative column, we have cells um, being positive for CD29 and um, CD31 negative as expected. And then here in the positive column, you can see that for all species, again, they're positive for the both of the positive markers. However, it's important to, for us to point out that for our landwire satellite cells, you can see here that there are two distinct populations uh, expressing the positive markers, whilst for cow, the CD56 marker is um, slightly lower, presents with slightly lower expression. Um, here we have the real-time qPCR um, primers. So we have PAC7, which is a critical regulator in satellite cell maintenance. And we have Desmin, which is also a gene found um, expressed by my satellite cells. And PPAR gamma um, is a, a negative primer um, because it's expressed in adipose tissue, but not in... Um, um, muscle tissue. And here we present some data for our lamoy satellites and also our calmoy satellites. You can see here that for both species, they present um, with different uh, levels of expression of the positive markers, um, just meaning that the gene expression of the positive genes just um, change uh, according to species. And you can see here that the negative marker, in fact, or PPAR gamma, is slightly being expressed in the cow mouse satellite cells. And this is due to fibroadipogenic precursor cells being present in cow muscle derived tissue. We've also um, had a look at the differentiation potential of our cells. And here I show some examples of the data. Um, you can see here on the left, we have a dipogenesis differentiation of our pre sites. And this is when we tested the same protocol on different species. So we've tested the protocol on cow and we've tested the, the same protocol on pig. And um, you can see here that for cow, um, no lipid droplets started to form, uh, for, form and um, there's no oil red stain. Whilst for pig, you can see here that there's cells that have been stayed with oil red. Um, and this just highlights the need for species specific protocols for differentiation. Uh, we also have uh, had a look at the adipogenesis differentiation of our bone marrow MSEs. And we, in fact, actually use differentiation kits from Thermo. And this is just to highlight the uh, level of differentiation um, just differs across species. As I mentioned, we're also suspension adapting and um, immortalizing our cells. So here I present some data for our lamb my satellite cells currently being suspension adapted. And um, we've started testing um, a variety of different factors. So we've tested various seeding densities, we've tested um, different agitation speeds, and we've also tested different uh, media formulations. Uh, the next steps in this would be to test multiple different cell types and then trying out some static suspension adaptation and then moving away from FBS and adapting the cells um, to serum-free conditions and then adapting them to also high um, cell densities and then eventually scaling up to shaker flasks and carrying out some bioreactor runs. And here on the, uh, the right, we have have cell banks that are currently being immortalized. So at the moment we have uh, pre adipocytes from each of the species and we have bone marrow MSCs again from each of the species. And at the moment they're between passages 17 to 23 and they have undergone um, a number of doublings as you can see here on the graph. Uh, the next steps for this would be um, carrying out immortalization for our myosatellite cells again for each of the species. So we've developed these cell banks to meet um, all the research needs. So please buy them, use, it, use them, and also edit them. Um, our goal is to develop innovative technologies and help people develop these technologies that will drive the industry forward. Um, you can have um, a deeper information on our cells and the catalog here by scanning the QR code and also taking a look at our um, uh, website. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, please feel free to contact me. Um, my email's here. If you have any further questions regarding the cell banks, and also if you have any sales queries, please reach out to cellsxcellular.com. Um, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Gabriella, uh, for that presentation. I'll stop sharing just so I can see. All right. Well, um, Thank you to both the presenters today. Uh, definitely some interesting um, 
you know, new, new services being offered by some of the companies in the industry. So appreciate that. Um, and we yeah, will send those decks out to the group um, next week. And hopefully some people will follow up with you uh, over email. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month.